Good evening and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines here in the south. Heathrow will grow a third runway, thousands of new flights. But tonight, the protests begin. What today is about is doing the right thing for Britain, doing the right thing for the whole country. Heathrow, in the long term, is not in the right place, and I'm afraid a third runway is, uh, is undeliverable. So what's next for Gatwick? No new runway for now, but airport bosses say they won't give up. And it takes off from the finest runway in the world. From humble beginnings, a look back at aviation in the south and how we became home to the jet set. Also tonight, look, no hands. Getting ready for the driverless cars heading for the south's motorways. Good evening. It's taken many years, decades to get this far, but today the government gave the go-ahead to airport expansion at Heathrow, the first full-length runway in the southeast since the Second World War. We believe that the expansion of Heathrow Airport and the Northwest Runway Scheme, in combination with a significant package of supporting measures on the scale recommended by the Airports Commission, offers the greatest level of benefit to passengers business and to help us deliver the broadest possible benefit to the whole of the United Kingdom. The £17 billion third runway means thousands of more flights and tens of thousands of new jobs. And while that decision has been welcomed by the Hampshire-based National Air Traffic Control Service, not everyone is happy. The Foreign Secretary and former London Mayor Boris Johnson said the decision was undeliverable and likely to be stopped. Brighton Pavilion's Green MP Caroline Lucas has argued it will damage the environment. More than 76,000 people already work at Heathrow and that figure will almost double with the new runway creating a further 72,000 more jobs. But it also means more flights from 480,000 a year to 740,000. The runway should be operational in 2024 or 2025. Well, in a moment we shall cross airside at Heathrow to our transport correspondent Mike Pearce, to Derek Johnson at Gatwick Airport and to Andy Dickinson in the nearby Sussex village of Ifield and to our political correspondent Phil Hornby at Westminster. But first, Mike Pearce with reaction to today's announcement. Yes, indeed. I should say, though, that this is very much the consultation phase now. The government is giving it the go-ahead, but a year or so of consultation first. We will not get a final decision, possibly until uh, as late as the spring of 2018, when MPs will actually have a final say uh, in the House of Commons. But the government is saying they think it's good for jobs, tens of thousands of jobs that we've heard already. They say it'd be prosperity for the South, for the whole country as a whole. Uh, and that message was echoed by the bosses here at uh, Heathrow this afternoon. This is a great day for the whole country. The Prime Minister has made a clear decision that she wants a third runway Heathrow to be built. She's shown that she wants uh, an economy that works for everyone by backing Heathrow expansion. And now we want to do the hard work of making sure that we deliver the airport that Britain needs to make sure it remains one of the world's great trading nations. So where will the new runway actually go? Well, you know, Heathrow currently has two runways called the Northern and Southern Runway. Uh, the new runway will actually go to the north of the existing runways and that will be near the uh, M4. And in fact, part of it will go in a tunnel uh, uh, over, the, uh, over the M25. And I think that is gonna be uh, a feat in itself to see if they actually manage to do that. Well, of course, views here are mixed. Jobs on one side, uh, emissions and noise for hundreds of thousands of people potentially uh, under new flight paths and they will be uh, in Surrey, Hampshire and in Berkshire. Well, this was the reaction under the flight path in one of the villages near the airport, uh, Harmonsworth, that will be badly affected earlier today. We think it's going to be a war of attrition for five years, but as before, we think it will end up failing. You know, the economics probably won't be there. Uh, the costs will outweigh the benefits in many ways. And we think in five years' time, it'll get abandoned again. <laughs> And so, of course, this is a debate that will continue. But as I say, it will be possibly a year or 18 months before we do get that final decision in the House of Commons. 
Michael Heathrow, thank you very much indeed. So, what now then for Gatwick? Well, the West Sussex airport has come out fighting, pledging to continue planning for its second runway. Well, our correspondent Derek Johnson is at Gatwick for us this evening. Derek, disappointment there this evening. Yes, absolutely, Sangeeta. There are winners and losers in all of this, and Gatwick has lost out tonight. It always put forward a very strong case to say it had the most credible plan, the most deliverable plan, could build another runway in 10 years, actually build it in five, deliver it in 10, but it has lost out. Now, that's bad news for the business interests who wanted to benefit from the economic boom a new runway would bring, but good for the residents who said there would simply be too much noise. We'll look at the future of Gatwick in a moment, but first, here's a report from Malcolm Shaw. This was Gatwick's vision of its future as a two-runway airport, a vision which now looks to be grounded for the time being at least. It's a bitter disappointment to those who've lobbied hard for Gatwick and doubt whether expansion at Heathrow will ever actually happen. For all the words spoken saying that Heathrow is the chosen one, actually Gatwick is the deliverable one and this is what's important. Heathrow is going to get tied up in years of judicial review, years of fundraising issues, trying to find the money, trying to get the airlines to pay for its development and all these other things. Whereas Gatwick has got the land, it's got the funding, it's got the impetus behind it. Despite today's announcement, Gatwick says it will still forge ahead with its runway plan and there's plenty of support for that view among local businesses. Assurity Consulting helps companies meet health and safety regulations. Staff often need to fly to clients across the country and across the world. I feel that Gatwick definitely need to continue with their plans so that the local economy and local businesses in the Gatwick Diamond region can all benefit from the second runway that we all hope will be built. Gatwick argued that building a new runway here would be quicker, cheaper and less polluting than at Heathrow. But conservationists are furious that even now the airport won't accept defeat and they're already preparing to fight Gatwick through the courts if necessary. To go on ahead regardless of the government's decision, I think that's showing that they are interested in their stakeholders and their profits and not what the best option is really for the South East and the communities and the environment of the South. Um, I think it will also be open to challenge legally and scrutinised quite heavily. This remains a deeply divisive issue. Towns like Horsham benefit from the jobs the airport generates but also bear its environmental impact. I don't think that Gatwick needs to be a second runaway at all. I think it's fine. We just desperately need a new runway here in here at Gatwick, we're definite. We don't like all the noise and all the extra traffic, but I think it's, it's for the future. Gatwick is already the world's busiest single runway airport and nearing full capacity years ahead of schedule. The arguments over whether a second runway here can still be justified seem set to rumble on. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News, Gatwick. Well, Gatwick has been around since the 1930s. There's always been talk of expanding. What now? Uh, we're joined by Alastair McDermott. You headed the bid for another runway. That's it now, all over? No, it's not all over yet. Naturally, we're very disappointed with today's announcement, but we remain very upbeat about the future prospects for Gatwick. We've got another billion pounds uh, of investment planned over the next five years on top of the billion pounds that we've already invested over the last five years under our, our new ownership. Uh, so we've got a very positive future in front of us. Beyond that, we're going to continue to look in detail at what the government's had to say in its decision today, but we'll take time to look at that. Any thought you might challenge the decision? Well, anyone can legally challenge these decisions. That's not what's in our mind at the moment. Uh, what we've seen from the government today is really just the headlines. What we want to do is to take some time to consider uh, the full detail of what the government said and why it's come to the view it has. Well, thank you very much. There you have it, Gatwick Airport taking stock. There may one day be a second runway here, not, it seems, in the immediate future. Thank you. So, good news then for those who've campaigned for so long against airport expansion in Sussex. Andy Dickinson is in Ifield near the Gatwick runway. Andy, what's the mood there? 
Well, Fred, remarkably, this battle for a second runway at Gatwick has been going on since the 1950s. Peter Jordan, you've been fighting this expansion for many years. How do you feel about today's announcement? Very relieved, but we're sorry about the people in Heathrow. We're feeling very sorry for them. Are you confident that this decision by the government will go through? No, not really. It could, anything could happen at this point. Um, but if they came back to Gatwick, they'd be starting from scratch. Or that the environmental concerns will be met. That's also a factor, isn't it? Well, that's also something I can't tell you. Um, it looks a bit dodgy to me, but um, we're hoping. Sally Pavey, the residents here so passionately against these plans, yet the mood this, uh, this afternoon in the pub when the announcement was made was quite sombre. Why was that? Um, I guess probably we couldn't believe it, couldn't quite believe what we were hearing, that it was uh, an adamant decision. So good news for us, relief for us, but obviously, you know, we don't wish this on anybody. And we've always said that there's no need for a new runway in the South East. So for us, yes, it was a bit of a sumble because you just don't wish it on anyone. It could have been us. Thanks, Sally. Peter, well, there will be celebrations obviously here tonight. But much like Gatwick itself, this community is ready to fight on. Andy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. Well, 60 of Theresa May's own Conservative MPs had threatened a revolt against the, Heath the Heathrow option. So what happens now? Let's go over to our political correspondent, Phil Hornby, with all the reaction in Westminster. Phil. Sangeeta, what happens next? Well, there'll be uh, lots of argument, that's for sure. According to the protesters who are here first thing this morning, there could be a lot of direct action to try and stop this. But most MPs, crucially, do seem to, uh, to, to support these proposals, especially those around Gatwick. 8.30 this morning, protesters from the action group Plain Stupid make their voices heard. No runway expansion, they said. As they protested, a few hundred yards away, ministers were arriving for the crucial cabinet meeting. Unusually, those who disagree will be allowed to say so until the decision's finally approved by Parliament in 12 or 18 months' time. Late morning, more protests in Whitehall as the announcement's made. Then, the reaction. I uh, welcome the government's uh, confirming what the Airports Commission um, have said is uh, right uh, for uh, this country. Surely it would have been better to have uh, agreed for extra runway capacity at both Gatwick and Heathrow. This is a great announcement. It's the right announcement. It's taken in the national interest. It's the best way of getting economic growth, not only to London and the South East, but right the way across the country. There shouldn't be any expansion of aviation anywhere. If we are serious about our climate change commitments, that has got to mean that we do not keep promoting more and more flying. Most MPs do support today's announcement, but many Tories, including some cabinet ministers, say they're determined to fight it. I'm going to continue to make my point. I do think that uh, building a third runway slap bang in the middle of the western suburbs, the greatest city on earth, is not the right thing to do. So we have a decision today, but the arguments will go on. It is extraordinary to hear the Foreign Secretary at loggerheads with the Prime Minister like that, but Cabinet Ministers like him have been given special dispensation to argue their case while this consultation period goes on, which, as Mike Pearce said, will last 12, maybe 18 months. And then finally there will be the vote in the House of Commons, years' time, maybe 18 months' time, which definitively will decide. And the government say whatever the problems they've got with Tory dissenters, they have got enough MPs on side opposition MPs as well, to get it through. Bill, thank you. And for the latest on the Heathrow decision and all the day's news in the South, just go to our website, itv.com forward slash Meridian. Well, more of the day's news now. A man's been jailed for five years for punching and killing his girlfriend during an argument at a train station in Bournemouth. 37-year-old Daniel Bragg pleaded guilty to manslaughter. He attacked Julie Cook on the platform at Pokesdown train station in May. She died in hospital two days later as a result of her injuries. A hotel was evacuated after a chlorine leak in its swimming pool. 123 hotel guests had to leave the village hotel in Farnborough this morning while fire crews in gas-tight suits investigated. The pipe was made safe and no one was injured.
An armed robber has been jailed for eight years after a raid on a co-op store in Clanfield. CCTV showed 47-year-old Anthony Journey from Havant walk into the shop on White Dirt Lane in May and threaten staff with a fake gun. He stole £200 in cash and cigarettes. In a U-turn, the Isle of Wight Council has agreed to move forward with plans for a Solent Super Council alongside Portsmouth and Southampton. The Solent Combined Authority could see up to £900 million worth of government grants over the next 30 years. The island's council leader said it could still withdraw if the terms of the deal were unfavourable. Plans have been unveiled for a new shops, a restaurant and more than 80 apartments on the site of Bournemouth's Odeon Cinema. The 1920s building on Westover Road was sold for almost £4 million last year. A new cinema will open at the new BH2 Leisure Complex on Exeter Road next year. Now, it's the kind of kit that only someone like James Bond would be used to. But tonight, we've been given a first look at new car technology, which could be rolled out in just a few years' time. Yes, yeah, scientists have been working hard to create vehicles which can not only drive themselves, but also have the ability to overtake at high speed. Yes, and there's a move towards advanced onboard equipment so cars can talk to each other and warn of problems ahead. Here's Matt Price. I'm not touching any of the controls now because I've initiated the system with the... A whole new meaning to an in-car hands-free kit. ITV News has been given a first look at technology which could be built into cars of the future. Wait for that that deliberate long press and that's what initiates the system. And Kitted out with cameras and radars, this is no ordinary 4x4. Autonomous overtaking technology to make our roads safer and our lives that little bit easier. It's the first time that we've had... Um, a number of different car manufacturers all working together to demonstrate the future effectively so what what uh, what the world will be like when cars can talk to cars and cars can talk to infrastructure the program here which has government backing has also unveiled a host of other high-tech gadgets uh, we are receiving a signal from the traffic light in front of us wi-fi enabled traffic lights which beam information to nearby vehicles the idea is to ease congestion the technology sends a signal to a car approaching these traffic lights telling the driver that they're on red it means they can adjust their speed so by the time they get here the lights have changed to green but the science goes further than that in the future our cars could communicate with each other new equipment here which alerts a vehicle to harsh braking several meters ahead each part of the system has got a transmitter and there's a receiver system so there are certain signals being transmitted in a particular structure it will know when the car in front is starting to do an emergency brake manoeuvre and it will give the drivers following those valuable seconds to react quicker. And although these are only prototypes, with the right investment experts say the systems could be rolled out in just a few years. But is this kit, which can ultimately control our cars, a cyber security risk? You're working hard to ensure people can't hack into these systems. Absolutely. Are they hack proof? Um, I wouldn't say that they're hack proof, but it's a case of managing the risk. Certainly cybersecurity is a, a problem that the industry has to address and it's working hard to do that. Designers are pushing ahead and are planning for further tests on real road conditions by 2018. And while it could be a couple of years before we put our total trust in technology to get us from A to B, it's certainly heading in the right direction. Matt Price, ITV News. Well, from the roads back again to the air and from small wartime airfields, Heathrow and Gatwick have grown beyond anyone's imagination. Heathrow always considered to be London's number one airport, Gatwick its number two. Well, in the run-up to the government's announcement, though, many observers felt that Gatwick was the one with the potential to expand further, with Heathrow dogged by planning, environmental and political issues, as well as local opposition. Martin Dowse looks at the growth and historical rivalry of London and the South's two major airports. Heathrow, Britain's £20 million airfield, is opened by Lord Winster. The first civilian plane to take off from Heathrow in 1946 looked rather like it was off on a bombing mission, but it was passengers, not explosives, that took to the skies above the small airfield west of London that had caught the government's eye. And it takes off from the finest runway in the world. 
Wiltshire-based aviation author Adrian Bolch has written about the growth of our airports. He says Heathrow's expansion was environmentally controversial from the start, but the government of the day was dead set on its course to help post-war Britain take to the skies commercially. The government bought up that as being the, the main airport closest to London and we're going to develop it as a wartime transport base for Far East operations. And uh, they started developing that in 1944. By, by that time the war ended and uh, it was no longer needed. So they thought, well, this is a good place to have London's main airport. And uh, Gatwick had a similar story, starting in the 20s, developed in the 30s and uh, this was going to be a secondary airport. Um, nothing else was considered at the time. Um, Heathrow had a hamlet around it, Heathrow, and that was completely demolished, uh, much to the consternation of all the locals. And all the land was flattened and uh, it was built up. But there's not so much development around Gatwick. You've got Crawley to the south and uh, Hawley to the north, and uh, there's no actual houses of any, any substantial amount around the approaches to Gatwick. Gatwick opened a decade later than Heathrow, which was now the hub of British aviation, particularly transatlantic and long haul. But it was still something reserved mainly for high-end commercial travellers, politicians and celebrities. In uh, the 50s and 60s, um, the, the government was trying to promote air travel and uh, it was very expensive in those days and uh, a lot of people went there just to watch the aircraft and never actually flew. Then came Gatwick's moment as mass affordable tourism took off in the late 60s and early 70s and it became the hub for European and Mediterranean holidaymakers. Its runway was gradually extended and in 1988 it opened its second terminal. Really the 70s is when it started taking off, um, when aviation technology became much more f uh, efficient, fuel efficient. You had larger aircraft, the Boeing 747 jumbo jet, the Airbus, could carry more passengers, so that's when it really happened. But as the busiest airport in Europe, Heathrow continued to race ahead in size with its two runways. Terminal 4 opened there in 1986 and the government said that would be that as far as Heathrow's expansion was concerned. But then came hugely controversial Terminal 5 in 2008. Today, Gatwick handles over 35 million passengers a year, Heathrow over 67 million, and that will only increase further. The problem of where and how to expand will only keep coming back. Martin Dowse, ITV News. Our south became part of the jet set. Flight of a different kind now. Here's Simon. Yes, interesting ones. Have a look at this picture. Can you spot what's on it? Uh, it was sent in by Greg Wood. Those little dots there are yes, yes. ladybirds. He said there were thousands. It was like a flying ant plague this afternoon. And he counted, get this, 20 ladybirds per square metre of a 40 square metre wall. Gosh. That was two o'clock in Western this afternoon. Should they do that? Do you that? know what it's? I've no idea. Well, but if you got... busy, though. Well, I think so. And he had, you know, a bit, bit of fun, didn't it? Yes. Uh, beach bargain hunt. But, yes. uh, you know, let us know if you know what that's all about. Meanwhile, who needs a new runway when, when a river is just fine? Uh, Keith Lawson took these photos of a couple of swans taking off from the Stour Valley Nature Reserve. Very um, clever, oh, isn't it? Very graceful as well when they're flying, as uh, Les Hannibal in South Sea proof. Look at that gorgeous oh. shots there from the prom on South Sea Beach of the, the swans in flight. And at least they know what time of year it is. What about this? Any idea what that might be from Trevor Cridlin? No, I The young no swan? It's a pair of blue phase oh. snow geese oh, that have just arrived from North America, as they do. Well, well, well. So, and are they arriving to nice weather? I th they are. They've done quite well, yeah. OK, let's find out. Simon Parkin with your forecast. From blizzards to pool, driving through Europe, Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Now, as a special treat, here are two different starts to today. Uh, firstly, you've got Kevin in Bournemouth, who reckons that this is one of the most gorgeous sunrises he's ever seen. It was pretty impressive, wasn't it? Meanwhile, uh, up in Abingdon, it was a slightly misty start for Becca. Equally as nice, but in a different kind of way. And if the mist is your kind of thing, you'll be pleased to know that there'll be more of that to deal with tomorrow morning. Basically, we've got good news in so much as high pressure is going to sit on top of us as we head through the the next few days but 
we pick up a southwesterly airflow and that's a bit moist and that means that over the next few days we're going to have mist forming overnight that will be a bit slow and lingery first thing in the morning so brace yourself for some grey start certainly overnight tonight we are dry we've got clear spells and it's where we get the clear spells that we'll see that mist and fog developing where you can see the lighter patches on the map is where we we could well see some dense fog temperature wise though it's a mild one 9 10 degrees so nothing too cold the winds stay light and that really doesn't help with that mist and fog it's going to be slow to lift tomorrow morning for some of us it could be 10 11 maybe even midday before it breaks up but we've got cloud that is going to break up quite nicely so by the afternoon we should see more in the way of sunny spells and temperatures in that sunshine not feeling too bad well around 14 15 degrees with winds much like today of around 5 maybe 10 miles an hour as for your high tide times well you can see in Portsmouth around quarter to nine in the morning then just after nine in the evening and then nothing changes for the rest of the week Thursday morning will be another slow starter with some sunshine later Euro Tunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. And in just a moment, we've got the ITV Evening News with Mark Austin and Mary Nightingale. I shall have our late news. Join me if you can. But for now, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you very much, Dave, for watching. Take care. Join us soon. See you bye, -bye. bye bye.